few months ago <coughs> when I spoke to the EC about starting a series of talks that could be delivered by the youth or by the actual members of this community. So taking ourselves from just being receivers of knowledge to actually participating in producing and building on new ideas. And so it's, it's uh, quite nice to be the first one to be starting in the series of this talk. And my title today is Modern Muslims and Their Disconnect from Islam. When I came up with this title two months ago, I thought that this would be the best thing to talk about. However, after a little bit of thought, I decided I would change the title slightly. So by modern, I am referring to a period that is after the Renaissance. Okay, so after thinkers such as Galileo and Descartes. Okay, so after their ideas have come out into the open, then we begin the modern period. And I initially wanted to talk just about Muslims, but I thought that I would generalize this a little more. So rather than just Muslims, I thought I would take it to all humans. I was going to say modern men, but I thought I'd be told off by feminists. So <clears throat> I picked the title Modern Muslims and their disconnect from Islam. Again, rather than Islam, I thought we'd just go with the term religion. So the title that I hope to discuss today is Modern Humans and their disconnect from religion. So before diving into this question of what disconnects us from religion, it's quite important that we understand what is foundational to all religions. What makes a religion a religion? The very fact that we use the term religion to refer to so many different religions means that there must be something that is common in all of them. And the way that we can use a plural to define lots of different religions, we use the term religions, means that there must also be something that's different about them. <clears throat> so where is it that we can draw a line between unity and plurality? What is it that's the same about all of these religions? And what is it that is different about all of these religions? So I want to start by looking at the idea of a human from the perspective of religion. And from the perspective of religion, a human must consist of having knowledge. This is purely intellectual knowledge, which by definition is beyond the reach of the individual. And it, it comes from the universal or the divine sphere. So there is knowledge that exists within the universal or the divine sphere, right? This is godly knowledge. And that is the true, pure intellectual knowledge. And since anything that is produced from pure intelligence um, must go past something like reasoning, okay? It's produced from pure intelligence. It must go past something like reasoning. And it must even go past something like faith. So faith is still something that is below pure knowledge. Interne intellectual knowledge, therefore, is superior to the theological point because theological knowledge comes from revelation. So we have this intellectual knowledge which is superior to that of the revealed knowledge. But the theological knowledge, because it comes from a revelation, because it comes from the divine source itself, must be superior to something like philosophical knowledge. Because philosophical knowledge is just knowledge which proceeds from the, from the reason of a human. So divine re revealed knowledge must be something that is above that of, <clears throat> that of uh, philosophical knowledge. So knowledge that is pure can be possessed by an individual, but only insofar that that individual is able to connect to the divine through something such as a spiritual experience. So this, this uh, 
Intellectual knowledge can be possessed by an individual, but he must manage to connect to the divine. So we've now created three distinct types of knowledge. Knowledge that is individual, okay? So knowledge that comes from reason, individual reason, which is philosophical knowledge. The second type of knowledge is the revealed knowledge, the knowledge that comes from a divine source, something like theology. And thirdly, we have the intellectual knowledge, the pure knowledge that is connected to the divine. This is the metaphysics, something that precedes physics itself. So if we take an example from the sensory sphere to show the difference between this metaphysical and theological knowledge. If we imagine a source of light, okay, and this light is, as its very essence, it is a illuminating light. It creates luminosity. It lights up a place. But from a religious view, it is possible that one religion could see this light as being red, and another religion could see this light as being green. But this light, in its essence, is a form that illuminates. So the religions are correct in seeing it as red or green insofar as they see it as a form of light that creates luminosity, but they are incorrect <coughs> in seeing it as red or green. So the only pure knowledge, the only way to purely understand the religion is to transcend the, religious, uh, the, the religion on the purely material space and to extend to the esot esoteric space, which is the transcendent knowledge. So, the theological point of knowledge is composed of symbols and forms, and the symbols can take us to the, uh, to the higher, to the intellectual knowledge, to the metaphysics. And it's by following these symbols and forms that we can reach the divine, the God himself. So the only way for a religion to actually be true, to actually be able to reach this divine, is for it to have a source of revelation. It is the revelation that gives it a connection to the divine, because this revelation itself comes from the divinity. And it, then it is the dogmas, the rites, and other symbols that serve as means for expressing the truth known by these religions. And the truth of these religions can be seen by the eye of the intellect. And as is said in Islam, we have the eye of the heart. The eye of the heart can see the truth of the religion, and it allows us to transcend the exoteric world and reach the es esoteric world. So let me expand on this idea of this essence uh, lying behind the religion by showing you something uh, called the uh, Plato's Allegory of the Cave. So if I can play a video, I don't think I have this connected. Do I? Imagine prisoners that have spent their entire lives chained deep inside a cave. They have been chained so that they cannot see behind themselves and they are forced to stare endlessly at the cave wall in front of them. Behind them, a fire is burning, and between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Now imagine that each day, a menagerie of objects crosses the walkway. Animals, and people carrying their wares to market. Their shapes create an intricate shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners. This is the only world that the prisoners have ever known. The shadows and the echoes of unseen objects. Now, Imagine that the prisoner is released. After some time adjusting to the blinding light, 
the freed prisoner will begin to experience the world outside of the cave for the very first time. And it is like nothing he could have ever imagined. With his new perception of the world, the man will of course want to return to his friends to share his incredible discoveries. But the prisoners cannot recognize their old friend. He appears as all things do. His voice is a distorted echo, and his body is a grotesque shadow. They cannot understand his fantastic stories of the world outside of the cave. To them, it will never exist. This, of course, does not make the world outside of the cave any less real. So, from Plato's allegory of the cave, we can see that these, these men, they're being tricked into seeing the world as just shadows. So the actual form of the world that they see is just shadows. And they believe this to be the reality. But above this reality exists another reality, the truth of the reality, that the shadows are created by people. So the people are the actual truths, the forms that lie behind these shadows. The people see the shadows, they think the shadows are the truth. But actually there exists above these the actual truth, which is the truth of the actual people, of the actual world. And the same is true of religion. So above the religion, there exists a true form that transcends that religion. And it is that form that allows us to unify the religions, that allows us to see what is common between the religions. It is when we take it to this extended form, when we actually look at the essence of the religion, the form of all of the religions, that we see the very same thing in all of them. We see this belief in a transcendent in intelligence, a unity that lies above the other religions. So what we produce are lots of religions. And each religion is different in the material world, in the exoteric world. But in the spiritual world, in the esoteric world, there is a unifying point where they are all the same. This is known as the transcendent unity of religion. Okay, it is a unity that transcends the religion. And each one of these religions, by this theory, is equally acceptable. Okay? Because each one of these religions has come from a divine revelation. So the divine revelation is connected to the divinity. And so the, reli the religion itself is something that is correct. And as long as it is an orthodox religion, as long as it's still connected to its texts, it is a religion that is acceptable. And for you to be able to transcend the exoteric world, you must immerse yourself in one of these specific religions. You cannot pick and choose and take from one religion and another religion, but it's that one religion that creates, a f creates this whole form, right? So it is when you immerse yourself in the entirety of the religion that you're able to transcend this space and reach the, uh, the unity at the top, the esoteric space. But this is, of course, not possible for everyone. This is, this is not a possibility that everyone can, can manifest. But at least a knowledge of its presence is something that is necessary. Because without understanding of its existence, we're left with a very dry religion, a religion that cannot really tell us very much about the earth, a religion that is limited. It's only when it is able to go above its very existence, only when you are able to reach 
the godly sphere, the divine sphere, the unity at the top, that we are able to see what the actual nature of the religion itself is. So, to illustrate the three modes of reasoning within uh, this, this idea, let us look at the idea of God. So, the philosophical argument tries to prove God. It either tries to prove the existence of God or the non-existence of God. But the very nature of proof is something that philosophy cannot really do. Because how can reason, which is only an intermediary between the, the actual true form of the knowledge, the unity above, and the exoteric form, how can it possibly manage to prove anything? Reason is not a proof for anything. Proof is something completely different. From a theological point of view, theology doesn't even bother trying to prove religion, to prove God. Theology assumes the existence of God and it expects you to believe in the existence of God. So theology is just a belief in a God. But there is obviously a slight problem with this. Faith cannot just be reduced to belief. And in the Quran we have believers are those who, are, who when Allah is mentioned feel a tremor in their hearts. How is it possible for a belief to just bring about a tremor? It has to be something more than a belief for it to be something that can, that can do this to the heart. And from the metaphysical point of view, if we try to look at God, there is no question of proof or belief, but just direct evidence. Because the existence of God is evident to someone who has entered the esoteric plane. And the intellectual in, uh, <clears throat> evidence implies absolute certainty. And so this is the difference between our philosophical proof, our theological proof, and our metaphysical proof. It is only the metaphysics that is actually able to show without a doubt that God exists. In Islam, we can see that this idea of <clears throat> a transcendent knowledge, one that lies in the esoteric plane, is, is something that is there. In Islam, we have the, idea, the qalama that we will all recite when we become Muslim. And we say, La ilaha illallah. There is no divinity save the divinity, save the sole divinity. Save the divinity. So there is no God except the God. Or there is no intelligence except the intelligence. The term God is used as a, <clears throat> as a symbol to show many other things. It is not just God. It is intelligence. It is reality. It is the absoluteness. God is all of these things. And so the very kalama that we recite affirms that we have this, this, this transcendent knowledge that lies on the esoteric plane. And the second part of our kalama, uh, Muhammadur Rasulullah, Muhammad is the messenger of the divinity, shows that the way to connect to this esoteric plane is through Muhammad himself. So Muhammad, the, the perfect, is the messenger, which is the symbol of the divinity. So Muhammad is a symbol of the divinity. And this shows that the very connection to this extended plane comes through the, um, through the religious beliefs and the religious doctrines. And it's incredibly important that these religious beliefs and religious doctrines are followed in order to be able to have a chance at reaching the esoteric plane. So we come back to the main um, question that we started with. Modern humans and their disconnect from religion. We understand now that we have an intelligence that transcends reality, that transcends the, the um, exoteric world. And we have the religion 
that lies within the exoteric world, but gives us a way of connecting to the esoteric. Now, the main problem of modern society is that we deny completely the capacity for metaphysical or spiritual thought. This thought, or this denial of this metaphysical thought, has been something that has been developed over the past 300 years. So denying the metaphysical is fundamentally in opposition to re the religious pos position. To deny it is to dehumanize man. And it's to take away the forms from him, the actual image of the divine that is uh, available through the esoteric plane. So prior to modernization, there was a belief that man was considerably, considerably different. Now, before um, modernization, I'm not saying everything was perfect, but there was a difference in belief. The underlying primary concern of everyone prior to modernization was religion. Any conception that would up upset the overriding conception or the beauty uh, and balance was not allowed through. It was rejected. So the medieval man saw that the heavens as concentric spheres uh, extended from the earth to the limitless sphere of the divine spirit. They had a belief that the, that the earth was the center of the uh, universe and everything else went around the earth. And they went in perfect concentric rings, each ring turning the ring uh, inside it. So you had the outermost ring turning the inner rings and each one of these rings was spinning and so you had the movement of the uh, the, the earth you had the move you had the movement of the sun the movement of all the other planets but the question was how did the outermost ring move and the answer that they were that they used to give in the medieval period was that the outermost ring was moved by God himself so God was a very nature or a very part of the uh, early society and whilst their idea of the universe or the solar system may have been incorrect, whilst it was incorrect to say the earth was the center, what cannot be taken away from them is that they had the divine spirit at the center of their belief. And this divine spirit is far more important than getting to the actual truth. Because once you remove this, it becomes very hard to see, to see anything, to see why anything is done. And it wasn't until the 18th and 19th century that man began to think of using machines and gadgets to pr produce concrete results of a quantitative nature. So they began to think that because they had uh, accepted a philosophy which proclaimed man as being a two-legged animal whose destiny and needs could best be fulfilled through the pursuit of social, political, and economic self-interest and the pro provision of an ever-increasing number and variety of, modern go of material goals. So the very nature of man changed. Rather than putting God at its center, it began to put itself at its center. It began to put materialism at its center. And a great development was needed uh, in the means of exploiting the, the material society. And so they called upon certain people who were able to do this, and the people who were able to do this were the scientists. The scientists became the center of the social and the economic scene by raising the level of, uh, of the means by which they had to exploit the materials the scientists began to take the place of the priests, not speaking of the kingdom of heaven, but they started speaking of the world of the consumer of goods and limitless economic growth. They began to think uh, about different ways that they could explain the nature of the earth, the nature of creation, without uh, referring to creation in any sense. The foundation of this uh, takeover 
the foundations were laid by certain personalities such as people like Galileo, Descartes, and Newton. Galileo fostered the idea that knowledge could be obtained only through mathematical techniques. He came up with the idea that only numbers could explain anything, and anything that could not be explained by numbers could not be true. Descartes, on the other hand, formulated the principle of, this, of a new science. He created a dualism. He separated completely the idea of God from the idea of the material. He completely put the idea of God somewhere else. He said it was unconnectable. He essentially made it something that couldn't be connected to and only made the sphere of the person something that was uh, accessible. He reduced the soul to nothing more than reason and clear and distinct ideas which he required in order to create a philosophy that was coherent with the idea of actual existence. And then Newton came along a little bit later and he took away completely the sacred and the spiritual qualities and he removed, noth and he removed uh, everything and nothing could be... Um, uh, could be accepted except for what was capable of being measured, right? So Newton created the idea of the sciences. So Newton changed the celestial spheres into machines. Descartes changed animals into machines. Hobbes came along. He changed society into a machine. Then we have other philosophies like Le, Le Matri coming along and changing the human body into a machine. And essentially what happened during this period was that the world was mechanized. It was all <coughs> created into a form that was very mechanistic, very machine uh, driven. The idea of God was something that began to vanish and disappear. And the world the worldview founded <coughs> on this idea of a machine brings about it a creation of a world that emulates the ideas that our humans believe. So if the humans believe in the idea of a mechanistic being, then they begin to create a society that is in itself mechanistic. So the world itself began to transform away from a world where God was something that could be seen to something that became very mechanistic. And science had not just crept into the field of, um, of uh, thought and uh, of these small things. It became something very important. It became a philosophy of life. And it regarded itself as the best of knowledge. It still does regard itself as the best of knowledge. It's taken over, over the very the very foundations of our arguments, to now put an argument fo forward, we must put an argument forward within the realms of science. So we must ask the question, does it actually deserve this position? Is science a sound science? So science is essentially defined as statements which either can be verified with reference to empirical evidence or experiment, or at least cannot be shown to be false, false with reference to such evidence as experiment. So it presupposes two terms. Firstly, the, ca the faculty capable of form forming um, scientific statements. Secondly, the objective world of phenomena that provides the raw material for the evidence and the experiment. Okay, So we have the faculty or the logic and reason that is used and we have the actual material world which is used to produce the very evidence that we use with the reasoning to try and produce a scientific theory. So obviously the reasoning is more important than the actual world itself because if the reasoning did not exist it cannot possibly create any scientific knowledge. So it's reason which is the faculty that's used to analyze and classify material, which is given uh, a f a uh, using the conception of logic and measurement and mechanical connections. Okay, So we use logic and measurement to try and work out what 
the scientific principle behind certain observations are. However, the scope of reason is limited to the material. It receives only ideas from the materials themselves, okay, without arising above the materials. So reasons can only know what the uh, reason can only know what appears to it in the form of the materials. But the material itself derives it from a reality that is higher than the reason. It has a form that transcends the exoteric world into the esoteric world. It is it it has a form that drives within the divine unity. So we are trying to comprehend something. We're trying to comprehend something that has a form that extends above the material world using only reason, which lies solely in the material world. Thank you. So if we are trying to comprehend something just using the reason, just looking at the material, then we have a problem. We lack the capacity in the, exo in the exoteric uh, uh, world to understand the form of the materials themselves fully. So we are unable to see what the underlying principle behind these, these, um, these material things are. So we refer to things that are far beyond the finite, within the finite sphere, within the sphere of the change and the impermanence of the exoteric. And instead of taking it above into the esoteric world, we are confining ourselves to the exoteric. So the science, by its very method, is limiting the possibility of what can be understood. It, it by its very definition, removes the esoteric world. So as long as you have a scientific understanding, you cannot have an esoteric picture. It does not allow for esotericism to exist. It does not allow for spiritualism to exist. And the science, the scientific attitude is permeated and it's vitally affected virtually every aspect of our public and private activity. The scientific knowledge has become virtually equated with the only way of knowing something. If we wish now to understand something, we have to refer to it on the scientific, uh, on the, on the, these scientific ideas. So I quote something from a, uh, from a, a paper written by Philip Sherrod, Modern Science and the Dehumanization of Man. For modern science has its origin in a loss of memory, a forgetfulness by man of who, is he, of who he is. By an intellectual logic inherent in this origin, it proceeds along a course, each step of which is marked by a further fall by man into deeper ignorance of the nature of everything else. Progressively divorced by the ignorance from the roots of his being, Man, so long as he persists in this course, is doomed to advance blindly and at an ever-increasing pace towards the total loss of identity, total loss of control, and eventually total self-destruction. Nothing can stop this process except a complete reversal of direction. And nothing can initiate a reversal of direction except a recovery of man, of an awareness of who he is. The cure must go back to where the sickness started. So, I'm not here advocating that we completely get rid of science and we forget all of the advances that it has made. But we need to start to see 
The way that modernization has affected our religious worldview. We cannot just say that we will completely secularize our society. We will have religion on one side. It becomes an individual phenomena. And we will have <coughs> politics and science and everything else on the other side. Because religion is something that is fundamental. It is something that is within everything. To separate it is an impossibility. Because it originates from the very essence, the underlying unity at the top. Everything is constituted within it. So what we need to start doing, what we need to start understanding, is this nature that is above the reality, that is above this exoteric world. We need to start seeing that there is more than just the physical. There is also a spiritual. And religion, more recently, has begun to also see itself as something that is just within this exoteric sphere. We're losing the esoterism within our religion as well. We are losing the sacredness within our religion. We are reducing our religions to nothing more than dogma. So I quote here from Frithjof Schwann in his book, The Transcendent New Unity of Religion. The exoteric viewpoint is, in fact, doomed to, uh, to end by negating itself once it is no longer vivified by the pre presence within it of the esotericism, of which it is both the outward radiation and the veil. So it is that religion according to the measure in which it denies metaphysical and initiatory realities and becomes crystallized in a literalistic dogmatism inevitably and engenders unbelief, the atrophy that overtakes dogma when they are deprived of their internal dimension recoils upon them from the outside in the form of heretical and atheistic negations. So if we begin to reduce our religion to nothing more than the exoteric, then we are doomed to negate it to nothing more than just just uh, an outward mean. We need to re-connect uh, ourselves with this esoteric sphere. We need to make sure that we see religion as being more than just a set of rules and dogmas. We need to make sure that we are trying to reach this higher essence, this unity that is above the religions themselves. And to do so, we have to embrace ourselves within the religion, but also understand its existence. Because the divinity itself is no longer something that is imbued within the society. It is something that is now separated. So we, once we start re-visioning everything in our society in the eyes of the spirituality, and we stop removing it and trying to just base ourselves in an exoteric world, we'll begin to transcend these problems that we are having currently and hopefully begin to connect ourselves again with religion. Thank you very much. So what? I think we have a few minutes for questions, if there are any questions. I missed a bit on why uh, you can't uh, use science to reach God. Can you make it a bit clear? Paul? So science, by definition, is it, it, does, it takes logic, it takes reasoning, and it applies it to the, to the, to the observations, OK? But the observations, 
the actual world, the material world, is not just what we see in the material world. It is more than that. This book is not just a book. It transcends that in the level of forms. So it has a transcendent form that is above its material presence. And it's only when we begin to actually connect to that transcendent form that we are beginning to get into the religious sphere, the actual esoteric space that is necessary for religion. But without that esoteric space, the religion becomes extremely dry, it becomes something that has no certainty in it, it becomes something that cannot give any answers. It becomes essentially like science itself, and it produ produces just uh, just uh, facts that are not necessarily based on any foundations. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> Um, uh, you seem to be advocating a pantheism here. <laughs> so, um, then how do you account for each religion claiming its own truth over others? Okay. So, in the transcendent form, there is a unity. Okay? That unity is a oneness. So, right at the top, we have that unity. But the form does not have to materialize in the same way. It can materialize in multiple ways. And that is what is happening with the religions. It is a materialization of that form in multiple different ways. And each religion, as long as it is an orthodox religion, connected to the divine through a revelation, is going to have a materialization of the divine form, but in different ways. So as long as you engross yourself within that one religion, you are within the protection of that religion, and therefore it is possible for you to transcend that religion and reach the divine unity. <laughs> but the unity itself can, can manifest itself with multiple forms on the exoteric plane. Are you saying that uh, any path is the same as other? So, we have this multitude of religions, and each religion obviously is, is sent down at a different time. And it is the timing of the religion that is important for which religion you believe in. So, for some of us, the preferred religion or the preferred way of getting to the transcendent unity may be through the Islamic path. But for others who are in a different context, a different circumstance, the path that they may wish to take may be that of a different religion. So Christianity, Judaism. But as long as they engross themselves within that religion and within that nature and within what the text dictates, because the text itself is divinely inspired, then it is, then in my opinion anyway, it is equally acceptable. Um, I have two questions. One, um, the first is, um, do you think that the Enlightenment had such a kind of devastating effect on uh, religious belief? Um, because for over a thousand years, religion was um, advocating this idea that everything revolved around the earth. And with the kind of disproving of that, it it led to a loss in um, kind of credibility. Um, and so do you think that the, ch well, to some extent the church, which was quite heavily affected by this, um, was, was so affected because it overstepped its reach in the sense that it was trying to explain things that were outside of its, potentially outside of its remit. Do you think that's a valid um, argument? Um, and my second question is, um, in relation to the previous question, where you were saying, as long as all of these religions are orthodox and they have um, a revelation that connects the esoteric to the exoteric, then there is some potential to reach this unity or this sun-like figure or 
or the kind of ideal form that is God. Um, but actually, how do you know, firstly, that these are divinely inspired texts, one? Um, and why is it that you have to follow one completely as opposed to f picking and choosing? I didn't quite grasp that, that, that the reasoning behind that. So I think um, if you could explain a little bit further on those two things. Um, thank you. Right, so if we start with the last of your questions first. So why choose one instead of multiple? So the forms manifest them. So the, the unity, the unified form, manifests itself in different ways. You could have Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of these different ways. But for the totality of that unification, you have to have the full remit of what that religion stipulates. Right? It's that fullness of the religion, everything within that religion, that takes you to the one unity. It's everything that that religion has which creates this unity at the top. Without, with missing few parts of that religion, you no longer have the full uh, manifestation of the form, and so you're missing parts of it, and then you therefore can't transcend to the above level. So if you start picking and choosing, taking from one and the other, then you start taking from different manifestations of the form and you end up with a problem of not having one complete uh, manifestation of a form and therefore a uh, difficulty in transcending to the esoteric plane. Your, s your other question, how do you know that the texts are divinely inspired? It is more difficult to answer, but... The way that you would go about doing this is by trying to connect to the esoteric plane. And once you are able to connect to the esoteric, you will be able to see the divine inspiration of these texts. The alternative is to compare these religions and try to see the, the manifestations of this divine form and see if they all contain them. It is a difficult and one of the biggest problems with this theory to how do you define actually which one are the divinely inspired texts. Okay, I, I don't know if I can add any more onto that. And lastly, firstly you, you said um, the enlightenment period and if the church was trying to go outside of its remit. Is that correct? So firstly I don't like calling it the enlightenment period because that implies that there is some enlightenment. But actually, it's the loss of enlightenment. We've lost God. We've moved away from the divine intelligence that we used to previously possess. And whilst in previous times, it may have been possible to have made some of these scientific advances, as we call them now, they were not made because of the want to stay within the context of this godlike reality. And to say that there is something outside the remit of religion is not something that I would accept. Religion is all encompassing. It encompasses everything. So to remove something from the remit of religion is not something that can be done. So the church was not trying to go to things that did not necessarily um, fall within the remits of their religion. They were still within, very much within, the scope of what they could speak about. Uh, obviously, there were some problems with the observational point they had, and it, it was something that could have been corrected and should have been corrected, but within not a scientific framework, but a religious framework. So as long as the this, this science was not put as something that was uh, basically made the greatest form of knowledge, and it was still the God that was the greatest form of knowledge, the divine that was the greatest form of knowledge, then these two could have been reconciled. And it's still possible to reconcile them, and we still need to work on the reconciliation of these two. Thank 
alaykum salam. Um, the, the point you made about um, divine revelation and the fact, the problem is, it's human interpretation of divine revelation. Then, as the sister was saying, isn't it more appealing to think that there might be strands of truth in all those religions which intuitively people can grasp to get to that enlightenment? So, slightly but contra agreeing with some of the things you said, that there's this divinity, but the problem is, as humans, we can't reason that properly. But then there might be aspects in all of those religions, assuming they are divinely revealed, that would help us actually achieve that enlightenment that you're talking about. <clears throat> so, for the majority of cases, it's going to be extremely difficult to connect to the esoteric for most of us. Okay? And it is the religion, the dogma that we must hold on to, to actually come anywhere near it. And each of these religions has dogma that is completely true. I'm not saying in any of these religions have dogma that is incorrect. All of them have beliefs that are correct. But it is a manifestation of a, in a different way of that transcendent form. And it's because it's manifested in a different way that it has a different belief. But that belief is completely correct. There is nothing incorrect about it. And each one of them has its correct, is, is correct. <laughs> I really enjoyed your lecture, by the way. Salam alaikum. I'm a bit confused about your statement that uh, the esoterical uh, and science are in sort of conflict, this deep, sort of really bad conflict. Uh, for myself, when I say scientific discoveries, all it does for me is enforce the fact that there is a God. When I say new scientific discoveries, I think to myself, wow, you know, just to me, it just proves that there is a God out there because science basically discovers the raw nature of the world, of the universe, of the outer universe and the inner universe. It shows that matter is so small, it can pass through solid objects such as the Earth without touching anything. It just goes straight through, yet it's matter. That, to me, proves that there is a God, in my mind. The Quran tells us that there are two, two types of people, those who, who see and those who don't see. Those who don't see will not see whether it's science or no science because they're ignorant. Those who are prepared to open their eyes and look and see will see, and science will help them to see even better. That's basically all I wanted to say. <laughs> so if I can start with um, your first point, which was that science helps you to see the principle behind the universe. But the scientific view is limited in the sense that it does not include the divine nature. Right? So it's when it sees these objects, when it analyzes these objects, it doesn't include within them the divinity that exists with everything. It doesn't include the God the godliness of all of the creation. And that is its limit. It, as long as we understand that limit, science doesn't have a problem. But it is making sure that we understand and accept that limit. And then and only can then science be a useful form, a useful tool. Right? Once we, once we are able to say that, say that there is an underlying principle of godliness to everything and that science is limited in what it can do, then we've resolved the problem. But if, you, if you were to combine science and religion together, that would become politics. That could then be used by powerful people to manipulate everybody else to do what they want to do. It wouldn't be science. It wouldn't be religion. It would be politics then. <clears throat> so it's not a complete combination because the religion stands above the science. So religion always stands above the science. 
and it is the science that is under it. It is the science that is helping us to, to, to manipulate and use the, uh, the exoteric world. But it is the religion that helps us to understand what its, what its, um, what its boundaries are, what its possibilities are, what its capabilities are. And it's only when we understand it within the picture of the esoteric that we are actually able to put the limitations to the science that they need to have so that they do not start to produce a reality that is completely devoid of any spirituality. Yep. I think we'll end there. Thank you very much. I'm sure Omar will still be around if any of you have any more questions for him. <laughs> so what? Uh,